لكن من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وله الحمد في الآخرة وهو الحكيم الخبير والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث إلى كافة الورى بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته أئمة الهدى ومصابيح الدجا الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال معاذ الله إنه ربي أحسن مثواي إنه لا يفلح الظالمون صل على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله as you heard a few moments ago, the Prophet who will be discussing today is Nabi Yusuf ala Nabiina wa alihi wa alayhi salam. And the story that we will be examining in relation to this Prophet concerns the topic abstaining and resisting temptations. So inshallah, we'll be looking at this in a number of stages, but this is something that is extremely important for us all to bear in mind. In particular, now that we are in the modern world and the world of the internet, the temptations that we must resist do not only apply to real temptations. More and more increasingly, they are offline. They are so, so they are online temptations, temptations from the virtual world. And therefore, this is a topic that really requires examination. And therefore, I have discussed this with regards to the Prophet Nabi Yusuf. And inshallah, we will see how this applies to us in our daily lives. Just as a brief overview to this great Prophet of Allah, his father was of course Nabi Ya'qub ala Nabiina wa alihi wa alayhi salam and Nabi Ya'qub lived in Hebron. Now he married a number of wives and he had a number of children from them. But from only one wife were there two brothers born and these were Nabi Yusuf and Benjamin, or in English, is known as Benjamin. So the other brothers of Nabi Yusuf, they were his half brothers. His only full brother was Benjamin. Now, it is reported that Nabi Yusuf was very pious, as was Benjamin. In fact, these two were the most pious out of all the brothers. And this led to lots of jealousy among his other brothers. So this is how this the whole story develops as a context to that incident that leads up to the whole event that we will be discussing. I will just give you the context in which it transpired. So now Nabi Yusuf, he is attracting the attention of his father a lot and this is making his brothers very jealous of him because they also wanted to be of that status in the eyes of their father but it was because of his great piety. It's because of his great commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Nabi Yusuf was like this. And then, therefore, we see that it is something quite natural for a prophet of Allah to have this great affection for his son who is closer to Allah than the other uh, members of his family. So now, the brothers devise a plot. They want to try and somehow get rid of Nabi Yusuf. So they take him under the pretenses of just taking him uh, for play 
and they convinced their father to be able to take their, their brother. Their father reluctantly agrees and now they, they plot to throw him in a well. And the idea being that somehow a caravan will find their brother and take him off to a far off land and they will be done with him. So this is what they do. They go back to their father and they lie to him. They say that Yusuf was eaten by a wolf. So now Nabi Yaqub begins to mourn Nabi Yusuf. Nabi Yusuf is in this well. As it happens, a caravan comes along and takes him from that well and brings him to Egypt. There he is sold as a slave. And there is a person there known as the Aziz. So the Aziz is this nobleman and he buys Nabi Yusuf and he is placed in his house. So he's living in the house of this Aziz, this nobleman of Egypt. This house is very grand and his wife's name is Zalikha, often pronounced as Zuleikha. There's not much of a you know, discussion to be had, is it Zalikha or Zuleikha, but apparently Zalikha is more correct. In any case, this Zalikha now is where we pick up the story about resisting temptation. What transpires between her and Nabi Yusuf how does Nabi Yusuf resist the advances of Zalikha? And what can we learn from this to take forward in our lives, whether it's real uh, temptations or online temptations? Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So, the incident is as follows. Zalika, on the one hand, is reported to have been a very beautiful woman. Nabi Yusuf is young, he's unmarried, he himself, of course, extremely handsome. On the other hand, look at the place they're in. They're in that house of that Aziz, but now they're in the inner chamber as well. Z Zalika locks all the doors, so no one can come in, and nobody would have found out as well. She tries to seduce him. She solicits him. She advances towards him and she really wants him. Now, we must always put ourselves in the position whenever we come across these stories, inshallah, in another lecture, I will talk about how we can use the Quran in a more effective way. And one of the techniques is to put ourselves in the position of these great characters. What would we do in that situation? What did they do? And inshallah then learn from their example. Now look at this. So many temptations at this stage. And so now Nabi Yusuf is in this very precarious situation. He's being tested. What does he do? He recites these, verse, these verses that I uh, mentioned at the beginning of this lecture. The whole incident is described to us in Surah Yusuf, verses 23 and 24. He actually tells us about four strategies that we must use in order to resist temptation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the words of Nabi Yusuf, puts forward these four strategies. What does Nabi Yusuf say when Zalika advances towards him? He's qala ma'adhallah. Very first strategy is ista'adha. He says, refuge in Allah. Ista'adha is when we seek refuge in God Almighty. So this is the first thing he does. He seeks refuge in Allah. Now, what does that mean? Does it just mean saying, Ma'az Allah, A'udhu Billah, Minash Shaitani Rajeem? Does it mean that or is it more than that? Well, if we want to resist temptations, we must do true isti'adha. True isti'adha, part of it is saying that, A'udhu Billah, Ma'az Allah. But true isti'adha is not only that. That's a necessary condition often, but it is not just limited to that. It can be even it's the other in the mind. We don't have to necessarily say it, but true seeking refuge in Allah 
is actually moving away from that sinful activity. It's actually taking steps to take shelter, just like if we were to take shelter from some other danger. Let's say somebody shouts out that there's a bomb in the car park. Okay, now not to alarm anyone, right? But just say that was the case. What would we do? Would we simply say things and just say, we must seek shelter, we must seek, uh, seek shelter. Of course, we wouldn't just say it. We would actually go and do something about it. We would flee, we would take shelter, we would hide under something. We would go behind a wall or whatever the case might be. We would physically move away from that danger. It's the same thing, my brothers and sisters, when it comes to istiaza and any type of unlawful temptation. It's not just saying, A'udhu Billah wa Ma'adhullah, it is actually doing something about it and moving away from it. Let me give you this inspirational example from the life of one of our greatest scholars, Sheikh Murtada Al Ansari. You've probably heard of this great scholar. He is someone who is known as Khatim al Fuqaha wal Mujtahideen, the seal of the jurists and the Mujtahids. This is a great station of, uh, of uh, Sayyid Murtaza al Ansari, Sheikh Murtaza al Ansari. In fact, even today, his books are studied in the Hawza. His Makasib in Fiqh, for example, is still studied. His Rasail in Usul is still studied today. So what happened was, one of his students has this dream. In his dream, he sees Shaitan. And Shaitan has in front of him all of these robes. Now the interesting thing is that all of these robes were of different types. Some were thinner, some were thicker, some were bigger, some were smaller. And so he asks Shaitan in his dream that what are all these robes that I see in front of you? Shaitan answers that, well, I use these robes to throw over the servants of Allah. And then I pull them towards me. Now, this student of Shaykh Ansari in this dream, he also happens to see a very thick rope there, but it is cut. So he asks Shaitan that, what is this rope I see over here? This very big one which is cut. Shaitan replies by saying that, well, last night I was going to use this very thick, big one to throw over Sheikh Murtaza Al Ansari. But what happened was, on three separate occasions, I tried to throw the rope over him, but the rope just got cut and I never managed to grab hold of him. So now this student of Sheikh Ansari, he wakes up and he's pondering that what is the meaning of this dream? He goes over to Sheikh Ansari and he tells him the dream. Sheikh Ansari, he says to him, you know what, last night my wife was actually giving childbirth and I didn't have any money for the purposes of this childbirth and I was in a des desperate situation. But I remembered that somebody had actually given me some amana, something to look after for them. It was a sum of money. And I thought to myself that, look, I really need to buy some things and I need to fund this whole procedure of the childbirth. So let me just go over and let me just take this amana and use that. But then I did istiada. I sought refuge in Allah from the evil shaitan, knowing that this is not my property. It's been entrusted to me and I have to look after it. So I came back and I didn't use it. A second time, I thought about this. Again, I went over to it. I did istiada and I didn't use it. I came back. And a third time I did it and I came back. And so this was the significance of that rope being cut on three separate occasions. This is what is meant by true istiada, not just saying ma'adhullah, a'udhu billah min shaitani rajeem. That if Allah wishes in his infinite wisdom and his mercy, maybe inshallah will be helped. 
But that's not true. It's the other. It's what Sheikh Ansari did. Actually doing something about it. Not just saying it. Now, just to finish the story off, because it actually has a quite a, a funny ending to it as well. First of all, with regards to the wife, he tells his student that she gave birth and alhamdulillah, everything was fine. But then in the dream, this student of his actually asks shaitan this question that perhaps we might also want to ask shaitan the same question. And that is, what type of rope do you use for me? Just out of curiosity, what type of rope do you use for me, right? Because he had all these different types of ropes for different levels of Allah's servants. You know what shaitan responds to him? He says to him that, actually for you I don't even need a rope. Meaning I've already got you in my hands, right? So, inshallah we're not like that. But it just, the point being, of course it's a dream. And it's not authoritative for us. It's not an ayah, it's not a rewire or anything like that. But the point is valid. The point being true is the other is something that we must do in action, not just say it in words. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So that's the first thing that Nabi Yusuf does in order to resist the temptations of Salikha. He says, Ma'adhallah, but he means it sincerely and he actually is doing something about this. It's not just saying it. Then what does he say? He says, Innahu Rabbi, Allahu Akbar. This is the second strategy that we can all use as well. Indeed, he is my Lord. Allah is my Rabb. Look at the, the name he uses. Of all the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Innahu Rabbi. He is my Lord, my Rabb. Now, how does this work? Well, it's telling us, not only must we do is the other, but we must acknowledge Allah as our Lord. When Allah is our Lord, let's just examine the word Rabb for a moment. Rabb, we normally translate it as Lord, but it means Lordship of Allah. It means He, he is a nourisher. He's someone who takes care of us. He looks after us. These are all the meanings embodied in that word Rabb. So when we remember Allah, that He is our Rabb, what are we doing in fact? We are looking at these meanings that, Oh Allah, why do I need to even go after this temptation? When you are my Lord, you are my nourisher, you are the one who will look after me with halal means. All I need to do is be a bit patient, trust in you, and you will provide for me the same thing or even better inshallah, but in a halal way. Just like you have provided for me all of my blessings up to now. We should have this faith in Allah that He is truly our nourisher, our protector and our provider. He will provide for us. That's the second strategy we must use. Acknowledging that Allah is our Rabb and He provides for all His servants. Thirdly, what does He say? Ahsana Mathwai. He has given me a good abode. Now again, this is something that we don't do enough. We don't count our blessings. We always want what we don't have. And we forget what we do have. Nabi Yusuf tells us, if you want to resist temptations, think of what you already have. Didn't Allah, the first stage was, He will provide for you. But this stage is, hasn't He already provided for you? Are you doubting that? Even at the very least, it's your health, it's your Iman, it's your family, it's your religion, it's whatever you have, your experience, your knowledge, your perhaps wealth, everything that we own is belongs and comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when we think about this, Ahsana Maswai, what Nabi Yusuf is doing is thinking about that position he was in. Remember I mentioned earlier when I put the whole incident into context, where was he? He was at the bottom of a well. 
Now where is he? In this grand house. Okay, he's, he's there, he was taken there, separated from his family, but look what he's doing. He's counting his blessings. He's not thinking about all that he doesn't have. He was with such a great father, Nabi Yaqub, but still he's counting his blessings. Let's just think for a moment, what blessings we have. Why do we become sometimes so ungrateful? We just want more and more and more. When we want more and more and more, we are opening the door to temptation even more because we are never satisfied. We want more and then when that temptation comes and it's in the haram form of it, then we want it because we constantly want more and more and more. Sometimes we just need to say, Allah, you have given me so much. I'm going to suffice with that, inshallah. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. And then finally, the fourth strategy he mentions in this verse, إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الظَّالِمُونَ He remembers the Akhirah. He says that the Dhalimun, the unjust, the wrongdoers are never prosperous. So what he's doing here is thinking about the consequences. Let's think about that as well. Whenever we're faced with online temptation, real temptation, whatever it might be, think of the consequences. There is hisab in kitab. There is accounting to be done. Nothing goes, goes without any accounting. And he's thinking about the akhirah. There is going to be this accounting. But I would like to say, not just for the Akhirah, let's think about the consequences in this life. Let's think about our own dignity. Let's think about the level that Allah has created human beings at. We must have that sense of self-dignity that I'm not going to lower myself to this. Secondly, the consequences to our family. What if anybody finds out? Or, even if it's not that, what if somebody was to see me right now? At the very least, Allah is seeing me. At the very least, Imam Zamana, Ajallahu Ta'ala Faraj Sharif. He's seeing me. What if my parents were to see me right now? What if my community was to find out? What if this got out? What, it, what would it mean to my reputation, my family's reputation, the reputation of the community, reputation to Muslims, to the followers of the Ahlul Bayt? What does this mean if this gets out? Because there are people who will be very upset with me, they'll be very disappointed with me if this ever got out. Let's think about those consequences. Then there's the spiritual consequences to my soul. What am I doing here? I'm really blackening my soul for my akhirah, for my spirituality. And then, you know, we expect for all of our du'as to be accepted on the night of Qadr, for example. We expect to be at that high level of spirituality in the month of Ramadan. We expect it to have this effect on us of, you know, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ The fasting is there for us to raise in our taqwa and God consciousness. Well, it comes with actions including resisting temptation. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa Muhammad. Okay, so now these were the strategies that Nabi Yusuf used. Let's develop this a step further. Shaitan. Shaitan and his way of working with people. What happens here? We mentioned Shaitan, the way he tries to tempt people, but now let's look at it in a bit more detail. The first thing we need to know is that Shaitan doesn't force us to accept that temptation. He doesn't force us to go that direction at all. All he does, and these are not my words, these are the words of the Qur'an, is that, wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah, is that he only invites us. In Surah Ibrahim, verse number 22, what are we told there? That shaitan on the day of resurrection, what will he say? He will say that, I never had any sultan over them, meaning I didn't have any authority over them. All I did was invite them, meaning you, I invited you, and you accepted my invitation. You accepted it. 
فلا تلوموني ولومو انفسكم what a statement that shaitan is going to say on the day of resurrection it's a statement that we should always try and keep in our minds فلا تلوموني ولومو انفسكم don't blame me blame yourselves don't blame me all I did was invite I just knocked on the door I gave you the bait but who took the bite the bait is one thing, the bite is the other. So, let me illustrate this in a different way. A way that our scholars of ethics and irfan and spirituality have described it. We are told that we are created with a number of faculties. The four major ones are the faculty of anger, which I discussed last night, the faculty of, uh, the faculty of illusion, the faculty of intellect and the faculty of desire. So now, all of these faculties, they're all God-given faculties, they can be used in a good way or a bad way, and we discussed some of these things yesterday, but it is the intellect that must be in charge of all of these other three faculties. So the intellect must be ruling over them, not the other way around. Let me illustrate it by means of an example. Picture a fortress. And now picture outside the fortress an enemy that just is just dying to come in. And he wants to, you know, just run, rampage inside the fortress. However, the fortress has three major gates. And each one of these gates is the only thing that is stopping this enemy from coming in. Now, what's holding these gates shut is an army. Okay, so as long as that army remains strong, behind the gates, the gates won't open and that enemy will always remain on the other side of the fortress. Now what do these things depict in this example? That fortress is us, that's our soul. The enemy on the other side trying to infiltrate our soul is shaitan. He's trying to get in. What are the three gates? The three gates are those other three faculties of desire, of anger, and imagination. Right? There are three gates. If these three gates became weak, then one of these opens, shaitan comes in and he runs riot inside our soul, inside the fortress. What is the army though? What is holding back the gates? The army is our intellect. So our intellect must be in charge of the gates. Whenever the intellect, the army is weakened, the gates become open, shaitan comes in. So it is us who have the control in actual fact. It is us who will either open the gate for, to him or close it. So this is what happens with temptations. We have to bear this in mind. Our, our imagination is often running riot. It plays tricks on us. There's an insinuation there. There's a bit of flirtation there. Some words there. And imagination runs riot. Desire, as we, inshallah if we get a chance we'll talk more about that. And anger, as we discussed yesterday. All of these things are trying to run riot. But the... the the um, intellect must control them. If it does, they are going to be used for, the, for that soul to get closer and closer to Allah. It is how we use all of these things that determines our prosperity. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So now, let's look at another aspect of this whole discussion. And that is, what is it that can tempt us? The dunya we know. That the dunya, of course, it is very tempting for us to go after the dunya. But what is the dunya? Let's just explore this. What can tempt, tempt us and what must we resist? And then, inshallah, we'll discuss some more strategies, especially, especially with regards to resisting temptations from the opposite gender. Now, the dunya, first of all, all of these things that tempt us, we are often told that don't go after the dunya. Don't bow down to the temptations of the dunya, the world. What does this mean? Is everything about the dunya evil? 
We have this beautiful saying from Imam Zainul Abideen Salawatullah Wasallam Where he puts it into perspective. He says, Ad-dunya dunya'an, dunya balag wa dunya mal'una. Allahu Akbar, what a beautiful saying. He says the dunya is of two types. Don't just think the dunya is all bad, all worldly things are bad. No, a dunya mazra'atul akhirah, as the Holy Prophet tells us, it's a plantation for the akhirah. It's a means to an end. Anyway, he says the dunya is of two types, dunya balag and dunya mal'una. Dunya balag means the world that is a means for us to attain something else. It helps us to attain success in the Akhirah. That is looking at the dunya in a very positive sense. All the Anbiya, all the Ausiya, all the Aimma, all the great people, all of us, we must live in the dunya. They all lived in the dunya. How were they able to reach those high levels if the dunya was all bad? It's not. It's how we use it. So if we use it for that, for that um, role of it that enables us to get to the Akhirah, then it has a positive meaning. But he also says the dunya is mal'una. The other type is the curse type. This is when the dunya must be shunned. All the temptations of it must be resisted because that takes us towards the uh, Jahannam, towards hell. So now, we have this wonderful interpretation of this by Allama Muhammad Bakir Al-Majlisi. I'm sure many of you have heard of him. He's a compiler of this phenomenal work, Bihar Al-Anwar. And anyone who goes to the Hawza is totally indebted to his brilliant collection of Ahadith. 110 volumes of the Hadith of the Ahlul Bayt it took him and his students over 30 years to compile this work. And we are all really indebted to him, whether we are students of the Hawza or not, because we have all benefited from this work. May Allah grant him and all the ulama a lofty status, inshallah. So, in Bihar al-Anwar, not only does he compile this ahadith, but on many occasions he writes commentaries on the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt as well. And in one point in this work, he writes a short explanation about this tradition from Imam Sajjad, that the dunya is of two types, the positive type and the negative type. What does he say? He says that, in fact, the dunya is the sum total of whatever takes you away from Allah. It's the sum total of whatever takes you away from Allah. And the Akhirah is the sum total of whatever brings you towards Allah. Now, he then goes on to give some examples. So, let's say for example, let's take money. Normally, what would we normally regard money as? Dunya or Akhirah? Normally, it's a dunya we think, isn't it? Right? It's a worldly thing, money. But, Based on this, money can be your akhirah. Money can also be your dunya, of course, but it can be your akhirah. How can it be your akhirah? What about knowledge? Would you say that's a dunya we think or an ukhra we think? Usually we would say knowledge, brilliant thing, is something to do with the akhirah. Knowledge can be a dunya we think. Based on this explanation, it all depends on whether that thing is taking you closer to Allah or moving you away from Allah. So money, a so-called worldly thing, but somebody uses that money in the right way. They are earning for a living so that they can provide for themselves and for their family, so that they can support Islamic projects, so that they can help the needy, they can give to charity. How is that a worldly thing now? That is an ukhravi thing. That is a thing that will benefit them in the akhirah. It gets them closer to Allah. But of course, somebody is just after money for the worldly benefits, more and more and more, simply to be, have a luxurious life and to accumulate more and more wealth. That becomes a worldly thing. Knowledge. If somebody gains knowledge, 
simply to show off, simply for worldly reasons, for status, so that people say this and that about him. That becomes a worldly thing. But now using that knowledge for the services of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help people, to help himself and others get close to Allah, it becomes a ukhrafi thing. Salaam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So it's all to do with how we use the dunya, our intention must be pure and the use of it as well. So it's the golden formula, the intention, what we are going after that thing for, the motive behind it, and then how we use it as well. And therefore, the temptations can be of all different types. It can be monetary, it can be status, it can be knowledge, it can be a member of the opposite gender, it can be whatever we want to describe as our dunya. Our dunya is that thing that takes us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salaam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Okay, so, so now inshallah I'd like to gradually bring this lecture to a close by putting forward some strategies especially to resist temptation uh, from the opposite gender. Now, these are just some things, inshallah, that we gain from the teachings of the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt Let's see how this works. So, Nabi Yusuf showed us those four strategies. It can be used for any temptation. These four in particular, you will see, they relate more to that physical type of temptation. Now, first of all, what can we do? Well, we are told that lower your gaze. Eyes are one of the primary gateways to our emotions. The eyes, if they see it, that's when it has an effect on the heart. It has an effect on our emotion. But if we are lowering our gaze, then we are skipping that whole, that whole potential of this thought coming to us and then taking it further and further and further. So we are told that قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنُونَ يَقُدُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ That they should, that they, or مِنْ أَبْصَارِكُمْ That يَقُدُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِكُمْ means lower your gaze. Lower your gaze. Because that is a, that is a gateway towards, to your heart and to your emotions. So that's one thing. Try, let's try our best not to look at anything which Allah is not happy for us to look at, inshallah. Like I said, if we nip it in the bud by not even looking at it, then we have gone a long way to resisting temptation. So lowering the gaze. Secondly, we must be very careful about language and flirtatious behavior. So it's not always, you know, just language. It is also behavior. Often this won't be from mu'mineen, this will be from the other side. But we must not engage in it, we must not encourage the other side. So the other side says something a little bit flirtatious, says something that might spark something in us. Okay? So we don't have to take that bait and you know just go into it and now respond with a flirtatious comment, with a flirtatious remark. We have to be very careful of what we say as well. This is a primary way to resist temptation. And all of these things, of course, in particular in this month. This month, we are already training our souls so much. Look what we are doing in this month. We are resisting the bare necessities of life. Food and drink and those other things are what we need in life to survive. We are resisting those. So why can't we resist those other things? We can and we must. Inshallah, even after Ramadan. Ramadan is the primary training ground. It's that gymnasium for the rest of the year. And this is what we are training our souls to do when we talk about developing taqwa, that fortress of self-control around our souls that prevents us from committing sin. This is what we are doing. So surely if we are abstaining from food and drink, we can abstain from these type of temptations. We are told in the traditions that the true fast is not just fasting and abstaining from food and drink, 
The true fast is fasting of the eyes, is fasting of the ears, of the tongue, of all of our body parts. That's when we will gain the true benefits, especially on the nights of Qadr. And we will, inshallah, see those benefits continue after Ramadan as well. Okay, so now, making sure that we don't engage in flirtatious behavior and language, even if we never started it, even if the other side started it. Also, we are told that be careful of touching. Now, this type of touching can take, for, take, the form, take, can take many different forms. It can be just, you know, rubbing past someone. But what I'd like to point more to is shaking hands. Because it's something that, is, of course, is very, very common in our culture. Shaking hands. What do we do here? Because it's part and parcel of the culture. Well, there are a number of things that we must do. First of all, we are told and the, from our traditions and also from the ulama of spirituality and akhlaq, that when you have skin-to-skin -skin contact, something happens, okay? Something happens that it might not lead to anything haram, but it could well lead to, to the haram path. So, if we avoid that, then we are resisting that temptation. Now, when it comes to shaking hands, what do we do? There are a number of things where we learn from the fuqaha as well. Ayatollah Sistani, for example, may Allah protect him and all of our muraja, inshallah. They have very similar rulings when it comes to this, but of course we must all follow the teachings of our particular muraja. But let me just tell you what he says. So he has a ruling about this. He says that the first step is that if you can, avoid going to that place where you know that this might transpire. Okay, if you know something haram might transpire, that, that if you know that it's going to transpire, then only go to it if it's an absolute necessity. All right, so if you know people are going to shake your hands, try to avoid not going. But of course, many times we still have to go. So it's a necessity, we go. Now what? The next stage is to try not to shake hands at all. So there's a number of things that we can put forward here. One way, is of course to wear gloves because then you don't have that skin to skin contact. That is the crucial factor, skin to skin. We don't have that contact if we wear gloves. And of course, we're talking about non-mahram, right? Those people who we can't have that contact with. So wearing gloves is one thing. The other thing is to use certain strategies, right? Let's be wise about it. Such as, for example, just putting our hands like this and maybe bowing down a bit. It's that heart to heart, not hand to hand type of approach. Or explaining to the person and apologizing, just saying, sorry, I won't be able to shake your hand. Hopefully they will understand. If they can't understand, it's something that perhaps we can look at it for future generations as well to benefit from. It's like so many things that we are now used to, and Alhamdulillah, I've heard so many good things about, you know, uh, people at work over here and how they are with their colleagues and even at school, that Alhamdulillah, people are really showing this respect to Mu'mineen at work and they are appreciating that we have certain rules that we must abide to. So perhaps it will gradually kick on that people will know more and more about that actually Muslims, you know, they, they don't shake hands. So let's not shake their hands. It's something that can spread over time and even geographically to other places as well. It's a service that we will be doing to future generations, if not to our generation today. So this is something we can do. And the final stage is what happens if really these things don't work. Well, Sayyid Sistani and the other scholars, they talk about this concept of excessive difficulty and hardship, meaning that level that, order, that a common person, an ordinary person is unable to endure. So that's what we mean by excessive hardship. If it gets to the stage where it's causing us excessive hardship by not shaking hands, we are permitted to shake hands. Okay, so that's the ruling.
but only when he gets to that level of excessive hardship. So let's pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives us the tawfiq to be able to resist temptation insha'Allah. Just as a quick summary, like I always try to end with a summary, just as a recap, today we looked at the story of Nabi Yusuf and in particular how he resisted temptation. We gave a brief overview about his life and the context behind this whole incident that takes place with Zalikha. When she tried to seduce him, he used those four strategies. When he says that he seeks is the other and true um, abstinence and refuge from shaitan. Then he acknowledges that Allah is his Rabb. He acknowledges his blessings and he thinks about the consequences, in particular the Akhirah. We saw that shaitan only invites. We let him in if our intellect is not in charge of those other three faculties. When we talk about resistance to, to temptation, we also saw how this whole area relates to the, uh, the strategies that we put forward when it comes to resisting the temptations of the opposite gender. And we ended with some fiki discussions about shaking hands in this culture that we live in. Let's pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us with the tawfiq to follow in the footsteps of the great prophets mentioned in the Qur'an. Oh Allah, enable us to live and die with the teachings of the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt Oh Allah, forgive us and our forefathers for our sins. Oh Allah, bring relief to all those who are facing difficulty. And oh Allah, hasten the appearance of the 12th Holy Imam. Ajjalallahu ta'ala farajuh shaleef. Allah.